Hello and welcome to the Sexient Beings space. Um, I am Alex Pruitt. I'm a certified sex, love, and relationship coach and reality guide. I work with men, women, and couples plus who want to move out of their old toxic patterns, traumas, and beliefs to create relationships from a place of deep connection, pleasure, and fulfillment, whether with themselves or others. And today I am joined by the beautiful Rachel Rose. Aww. If you want to introduce yourself. Well, thank you. What a nice introduction. I am Rachel Rose. I am a psychologist and a life coach. I work with women who have been in domestic or narcissistic relationships, learn how to re-embrace themselves after trauma and reestablish their footing in life and who they want to be and their purpose so that they can grow and become the people that they look up to. Beautiful. So today our topic is sex, right? That, that very desired space by most beings, right? Yep. <laughs> Human oh, yeah. beings in general. Um, but it's, it's that space where it's also so wrapped up in taboo and shame and in my opinion really big lack of education and acknowledgement mm -hmm. for something that is so normal to experience but at the same time like a lot of people don't actually know what they're they're going into or playing with when they get there yeah. um because so. that, that shame, I mean, our generation had a lot more education around mm -hmm. sex than like my mother's generation. Yes. My, yeah. So slowly we're getting a little bit more, but it's still like so many things are taboo, like you said. Yeah, I know. And that's like, it's one of the things I love. Um, there's a lot of criticism towards what is it the 50 shades of gray series with the bdsm and kink community because it can portray really toxic dynamics in those spaces mm. um there's a lot that comes up around consent and um yeah and layers of communication at the same time like to me there was this really big gift in that coming into the public view because it gave people more of these avenues to feel a little bit more normalized in like having kinky or weird desires that fell outside the vanilla realm right um yeah and then and then it being deemed the word pervert in a negative mm -hmm. way yeah and sometimes it's um, <laughs> i'm just gonna say it um certain words get certain connotations depending where you are in the world yeah but like you can take power back from those words but they're still sexualized and uh shamed and there's just this whole i want to say like war path that you have to go through in order to get to that like comfort with using the word in a powerful way like for me it's the word cunt yeah and there's so much shame around that or or not even like my sister hates that word like she thinks it's so disrespectful and the fact that i'm using it means that i don't understand the the negative connotations that come with the meaning of that word mm -hmm. um but like I walked through that battlefield and at the end of it, I was like, I'm a cunt. Yeah. <laughs> I am and, a cunt and, and I have a cunt and. <laughs> yes, exactly. And that, that happens with the word pervert too. It's like, we mm -hmm. have to like reclaim that for ourselves as if like our sexuality and our, our interests are, are quote unquote fetishes are something to be ashamed of. Like, mm -hmm. We had like everyone's a pervert. Yeah. In some way, some form. Well, I used to love the the old um it was kind of the way to like 
throw it back at the person. So if you said something, right, that could yeah. be taken with a sexual connotation mm -hmm. and then somebody else like gets offended about it, you're like, well, you're the one with the perverted mind. What are you thinking? I was just talking about a cucumber, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, it's where that, that person who's getting offended, they have all their own Baggage. filters and beliefs yeah. and yeah baggage around what those terms mean yeah <laughs> and then it gets applied out to like well if if somebody's talking about this at all it has the same meaning it does for me mm -hmm. those layers of projection so beautiful and confusing <laughs> yeah and it's it's interesting because like everyone's maybe I should say everyone, the majority of people mm -hmm. are raised with a certain preconception taught by them, taught to them by others of what sex is, what mm -hmm. is healthy, what is responsible sex, what is supposed to be done, what's bad, what's good and whatnot. And there are so many different viewpoints nowadays like traditionally yeah. it would be like now sex before marriage blah 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 um and you know <laughs> i'm thinking greek as far as the greeks do like i'm not sure many people are aware that there's like an entire basement full of like greek pornography that will never see the light of day because it's <laughs> just so scandalous and the greeks were like fluid free love people they they mm -hmm. married women and had sex with women but then they would have like symposiums and you know have sex with the the quote unquote harems or the the whores mm -hmm. and then they would also have sex with all the other men yeah and then on top of that there was what was called the loved and the beloved which was you you know typically like a you know teenage early 20s boy and an older man and they would be in a like a master apprenticeship scenario but like they'd be having sex mm -hmm. and that was totally accepted in greek culture and that's all depicted in the greek pornography that's never going to see the light of day because now we're all like got sticks up our butts being like no 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 you can't put your dick there <laughs> we're like don't show don't show your boobs well i think i think one of the I mean, I'm sure there are other things I came across, but very specifically, like, this is over a decade ago, going through human sexuality, where I mm -hmm. first had that click of like, oh, like, society really does help depict how we're individually viewing sex, mm -hmm. was in this textbook I was reading, I was talking about some small tribe that still exists within the world, I don't remember the name or place of their origin or anything like that. But in this tribe, it is very normal that around the age of 13, so the phase of puberty, right? And mm -hmm. that transition into manhood or womanhood, mm -hmm. um, the 13 year olds would either, depending on their sex, go off with an aunt or an older uh, uncle. And that aunt or uncle would actually introduce them to the world of sex, mm -hmm. right? To help them understand what was going on. And I mean, this, the thing that like blew my mind and I still have a hard time with it is um, incest, right? I noticed that's a big block and there are evolutionary things that can play into that, but also many, many social things mm -hmm. as far as shame that comes up around it. But in the situation, it's the aunt or the uncle taking off this now like budding teenager, young adult to teach them how to have sex and show them that world so they can now have this like passed along knowledge mm -hmm. on it. And I remember reading that and there was the like ick factor in my system because incest has been a huge thing that was a turnoff for me mm -hmm. but also being like oh like 
I can also see why that can be valuable for them. And as to me, as long as it's something that's consensual, right? They're not dragging this kid kicking and screaming that this isn't an experience they want to have. Ultimately, like if that's consensual, I don't have as much of a problem with it. Was what I came to. But it really opened my eyes and being like, oh yeah, this is a thing that my system finds as a big no and stop and move away. But I can understand the value for this community in particular. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely um you have to look at other cultures and communities. Mm-hmm without the lens of my way is the only and right way yeah. in order to truly reach understanding. And I think that concept gets muddied globally, really, mm-hmm. with the concept of sex today. Like even, even just in the U.S. where we live, because it's so multicultural, it's so muddied in like what is right and what is wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, if there is a right and wrong with sex, which I don't really believe there is, um, when consent is involved, there's yeah. no right or wrong. This is consensual. Let them do what they want to do. Um, but. because there's just so many ways of life in the communities that we live in, in the U S there's so much more potential for that shame to arise and be pushed on young adults or even (laughs) grown adults (laughs) around the sex and how that works Mm -hmm. and fits into their life. And I think that it's, it's, I think people are so confused about sex nowadays that they're trying, they're grabbing at straws to try and figure out what works for them because we don't have a good list of options. So people are are testing out things that may or may not work for them, which is great. People should be doing that, you know, figure out how you, how you vibe. Um, But then that, those tests that people are doing are being pushed as if they are the right way. This is what needs to happen. Yeah. Monogamy is out. Polyamory is in, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of other examples. Uh, you know, Jesus is the only, you know, married, don't get, don't do sex before marriage. You know, all of these different viewpoints of, you know, things that people, the marriage before sex thing has been tested out and I I don't think it's really a viable concept anymore but I'm not sure if I'm making myself super clear but there are a lot of different um, avenues that people are testing out now Mm -hmm. but it's not and that they're being pushed because people are like hmm maybe and you know when, when as a researcher um, especially, you know, as a social science um, person, the psychologist, um, you don't you don't add up your averages and your statistics immediately. Like, okay, we've done one test. All right, we know this is the average. This is this is the statistical average of what this test has concluded. You do it over and over and over again for a long period of time before you say this is the way. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people have been taking that time with themselves, which is why I think a lot of that shame is arising up. Yeah. Uh, Both within ourselves, you know, we shame ourselves, but a lot of that um, comes from external forces. Like we may not, like, I don't think the the Greeks were shaming themselves because no one around them was shaming them either. Yeah. And so and I was watching this video the other day about um how there's no such thing as self sabotage. It's the same concept where uh we're not self sabotaging, we're not self shaming. 
we've been conditioned mm -hmm. by our experiences in our environment from a young age to view things a certain way, or this is the way of life. This is the right way. This is how things should be. Yeah. This is how you should act. This is how you should approach sex. And then if you don't do the shoulds, the woulds, the coulds, you know, all of those things that are, this is what I'm telling you, society is telling you to do, you need to feel shame. And if you don't feel shame, we're going to make sure we shame you enough so that you feel it. Yeah. And those, those are the things I look at as the should, shouldn't, can, and can'ts. Yeah. Right? yeah exactly. And when I hear, I literally will hear like, oh, I can't do this. And around five years ago, I started trying to condition myself to, if I heard that can't in my mind, questioning it, mm -hmm. right? Because there was so much, I was telling myself, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. And like my, my system had reasonable answers. Like there was one, it was going to do a sweat lodge and mm -hmm. in this, it was going to cost $50. I had met the person who was putting on the event before, but in that I was like, well, I don't have childcare. Oh, I don't have $50. Oh, I don't have this. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I, I took the moment when that initial, like I can't came up and went, well, why can't I? And then I got to listen to the reasons. And I was like, well, do I really know if I have childcare or not? Right. Yeah. And so yeah. I called, I called my mom. I was like, Hey, on this weekend, could you come hang out with Max? Cause I really like, I'm interested in exploring this thing. And she was like, yep, I can do that. Mm -hmm. The the $50 worked out, right? Like yeah, it was yeah, exactly. those limiting beliefs of what I can and can't do. That was keeping me stuck in like, Oh, I don't get to go have this experience that I'm interested in exploring but mm -hmm. the same sort of thing comes up so much with sex yeah because there is so much there's so much myth right that is still taught about sex is taught about our reproductive organs that just isn't accurate right I don't know mm -hmm. if it's old stories that have been passed on or what it is, but like, it is one of the things I would get <laughs> super <laughs> good soon. <right>? Sorry. <laughs> Don't apologize. That was the cutest. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But one, one of my favorite things, right. Or I have a couple examples of this one was there's a book called come as you are. And, Oh, I can't remember her last name. I may butcher it and I apologize. <laughs> You're butchering it, Emily Nagoski, maybe. Um, but it's all about female sexuality. Yeah. And phenomenal book for anyone who is listening. Her narration, I love audiobooks. She's hilarious. So it's great to listen to. But I remember listening to this and her talking about how the hymen, like breaking during like loss of virginity with penetration isn't actually a thing. Yeah, yeah. Right? There is a hymen, but it's a vestigial part. And it's just this very thin layer of skin. It doesn't break when there's penetration from a penis or anything else. It stretches. And that most, like, if there is bleeding, when somebody loses their virginity, it is that one, the person's body is not relaxed enough to be producing lubricant like it is not in that like balanced state of arousal to produce enough lubricant and so what's happening is with penetration it's causing micro tears in yeah. the other yeah. surrounding vaginal wall but my mind went a hymen's not a thing oh my god yeah <laughs> some women some women aren't even born with one yeah. And okay. also, um, that vaginal tearing and stretching that can lead to the root, you know, the breaking of the hymen, that can yeah. happen on a horse when you're six, it can happen mm -hmm. doing the splits for the first time, yeah. riding a bike or yeah, just and riding the bus. Like it doesn't have to be a penis. Yeah. 
Well, and there doesn't have to be bleeding at yeah. all. Yeah. And right? usually the, there isn't. It's the yeah. abruptness, like you said, mm-hmm. that creates that bleeding. Yeah. It's it's little micro tears, traumas, wounds mm-hmm. to the tissue. Yeah. Because the tissue isn't relaxed enough for what it's receiving. The other one and there there's definitely mythology that comes up around male sexuality as well maybe it's because I'm a female that I've connected more with the female ones right but the other one was it was even a guy I had gone on a date with he at some point in hanging out had told me that he did not enjoy sex on like when a woman was on her period and one of his reasons for that is a doctor had told him that when a woman is bleeding, it is her most fertile time of the month. And he he got an earful about women's anatomy and their reproductive cycles and everything uh-huh. else because I was so flabbergasted that a doctor is communicating <laughs> this thing. Right. I mean, part of me wants to say that that person is making it up. <laughs> Because it just sounds so absurd. And I'm like, no, they're throwing in the doctor bit just to like make themselves feel like they that will make them more credible. But one thing I ended up finding out through the Vita sex courses and specifically around the specialist who works in women's reproductive health was doctors like going through their training unless they're specializing in women's reproductive health on average, only get any information about a woman's reproductive health, it's like two to four hours. That's it. So most doctors actually don't know a whole lot. They know more than the general public. Yeah. Right. But their their knowledge around female reproductive health is actually very, very limited. And it's realm. also very new. It's only within yes. the last hundred years that doctors, actually more uh, psychologists and researchers, um, who also are doctors, but um, have even explored it. Like a hundred years ago, men did not believe that women could even have an orgasm. Yeah. I, that is something that like, even 10 years ago, it's like, well, yeah. women don't really orgasm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> or, or the fact that um, it is now concluded via study that menstrual cramping or pain is the equivalent of the pain you have at a heart attack. That's like within the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. So, um, Quentin, did you have something you wanted to add? I can see your hand raised down there. I think I just gave you permission to hop on. Well, if he wants to step in, he can. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, it's the the other thing like that was extra validation to this because I was like, oh, this specialist, like she probably doesn't know what she's talking about or that's just doctors from the country she's in because I think she's like, she's in Europe somewhere. Mm. Um, but my partner at that point in time, he was actually in medical school to go to become an ER doctor. And I asked him, I was like, how much training do you guys get on women's reproductive health? And it, I think he said they'd received their training already in that first year of med school. And it was four hours and that was it. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, hot damn. (laughs) We need to educate some people. (laughs) Well, I mean, as a psychologist, I also like what's not educated enough on top of just like reproductive health or just knowing Mm -hmm. the body and knowing, you know, how to like use your body once, you know, doing acts of uh, sexual natures Mm -hmm. um, is also like the biochemical reaction that happens during sex that it's not, you know, it's sex is different for men and women. Yeah. Or, Or people who are biologically men and women. Yeah. It's different. And it's it's a biochemical reaction 
that that influences the body and the mind that people don't really you know like there's this you know people say that the the energy transference between a man and a woman during sex is all woo woo but it's scientific Mm -hmm. like when a man ejaculates it's called semen and that semen is is basically from the brain and the spinal cord and it comes out, you know, it, it collects in the in the the ball sack, and that's energy, that's life force that's coming mm-hmm. from the mind down the spine, and then it ejaculates out. So when you're having sex with a woman, especially unprotected, you're literally mind fucking her. And there's scientific proof that like that affects the woman. And if it happens mm-hmm. often enough it's it's a chemical change within the woman's body yeah because you're putting your you're putting your mind fuck into her well because that's depending on that state you are in as well Mm -hmm. as the Mm -hmm. male that's going to impact your hormonal balance that goes Mm -hmm. into that production of semen and now you're dumping that into the female body which Mm -hmm. yes some of that's going to be expelled like when she yeah, goes yeah, to the course. bathroom yeah. or those muscles now relax but like unless she goes in and like scrubs things out the douche she can't really do that <laughs> up in the cervix yes right? yeah um, I there's do going to be residuals of these other chemicals that yeah. like what you're working with on that area is a mucosa membrane mm-hmm. and mucosa membranes are highly absorb absorptive I can't think of the right word. Absorbent. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) But like, because of that absorb or absorbency in Mm -hmm. that tissue, like it's not like your dermal skin on the outside of your body. Right. That skin. Yeah. The skin on the outside of your body absorbs to a certain degree. Yeah. But not highly. It's actually made to help keep things out. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) But the actual mucosa membranes, like the inside of the nostrils, the inside of the mouth, the inside Mm -hmm. of the anus, right? Mm -hmm. And the vaginal canal are all Mm -hmm. highly absorbent. Mm -hmm. I cannot say that word right now. (laughs) You're doing great. You're doing great. Uh, But yeah, so there, there, it does make sense that there would be more of that transfer, Mm -hmm. but that's not something people consciously think about most of the time Nor let alone educated on understand yeah and and a lot of that cracks down to like that is like a higher tier level of information on a met like biochemical level and a psychological level like um before that you know in, in my experience with my education comes the the psychological effects of intimacy Mm -hmm. Um, and how that affects and through that in the social sciences and psychology world we discovered the biochemical reactions through science but first we had to come to terms with the reality of how sex changes the brain on a psychological level yeah and that is and it has been determined it's different for men and women because of our biochemistry women are chemically and psychologically just emotional beings we're built to have that instinct of care because we are create we have the ability to literally create life mm-hmm. so we have a higher emotional ability and not saying that that doesn't mean that men don't have any emotional ability at all not saying that they just don't their their vagina fell out <laughs> literally literally <laughs> it literally fell out we're all women in the womb until the vagina falls out and then we become a man yep that, uh, that is very accurate it, it is and then, literally and then all on top the same of that, sorts of tissues and parts just rearranged in slightly different ways yeah. and on top of that like the vagina kind of falls out twice for a man who's like in the womb, the vaginal canal falls out and that's the penis. Mm-hmm. But then, and you know, that there's the, you know, 
the ball sack, which is the ovaries and the, the fallopian tubes and whatnots. Mm -hmm. That's still kind of up there still. And then when a boys get to a certain age, their balls drop. Yeah. So their vagina, your vagina falls out twice. <laughs> <laughs> Two different stages. Two different stages of manhood. <laughs> and all of it has to do with your vagina falling out. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know this for sure, but the question just came to my brain is like, how much of that affects that emotional level that exists within a woman whose vagina has not fallen out versus mm -hmm. like a, a you know a younger boy before their balls drop like how much how much more emotional are they because that still resides in their body in that sense in that way mm -hmm. physically because uh, I know that studies have been done on um the, the psychological change towards manhood and growing mm -hmm. and studies have shown that, you know, men are more emotional beings when they're young boys and that's something that is grown out of. And I wonder how much of that is societal and influenced by this, the environment and mm -hmm. conditioning versus also chemical in I, I would imagine there's some play with like testosterone being that main mm -hmm. right male hormone um mm -hmm. i think there there's probably a little bit too much at least in our direct society to gauge that well with yeah. how much shame and repression there is mm -hmm. around male emotion yeah um I even thought it was interesting. So one of my platforms that I will post content on is this space called FetLife. And it's kind of like Facebook, but for mm -hmm. kink and BDSM community. And I posted a just little like meme thing I created. And it was a, a dear men, like brief message just being like, hey, I want to let you know it's okay to cry, right? And like, you can be accepted and loved and held in this space. And mm -hmm. it's a beautiful expression of who you are. I've received one com comment on it since I posted it. And it was this person being like, well, this is a weird comment or this is a funny comment to have added to this space. And I was just like, really? Cause I kind of think it's perfect because in the work I've done, when we're disconnected from our emotional body, right, and dysregulated in that, it can very fully impact our sexual expression. It can have huge impacts on erectile dysfunction, um, experiencing pain during sex or numbness during mm -hmm. sex. Well, mm -hmm. Clinton is raising his hand again. You are you are welcome to come up and speak now, Quentin. Okay, now I'm not muted. So I think a big one with that, especially growing up. Hi, my name is Quentin. Um, a big one with that as a male that I think is a wonderful thing to watch and kind of understand, especially for that transition of emotions from a young boy to a young man mm -hmm. in that area is you can find it on YouTube it's called the mask we wear and it talks a lot about how societal views impact very heavily on young men's emotions um, and with how we were all, we're always told to not be a woman quit crying stuff like that and that has a very, very high impact on why so many men decide to keep things so bottled up and they're afraid to talk about their emotions because it's, mm -hmm. it's seen as a form of weakness. And so through this, through this video, they go through one of the certain points of talking to different prisoners even on how this has affected them through their life. And with it affecting them through their life 
and the different situations like that, they've come to realize that the more support a young boy has in his emotions and the availability to talk about the things going on at school and his social lives, even at his home life, if it's not supported there, like that gives them the ability to actually do more in the long run and to be more emotionally open later on in life. But I know for me, like personally, that it's been a hard thing growing through those traumas. And like once I like actually watched this, I was like, oh, this makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and I so think, it, and I think, I'm, I'm, sorry, another piece is. Uh, Quentin, can I have you mute your mic real quick? I'm just getting feedback now. Thank you. Um, there's a book called The Female Brain and one called The Male Brain. And they're, mm-hmm. they're great reads on understanding some of those differences, but it talks about through like the evolution in a male body and through the, and that growth cycle through the male experience and then the female experience as well. But in that, they actually talk about how in whatever studies they were going through, there is a much higher rate where little boys are even receiving less physical touch and holding, right, in that caring and nurturing way at earlier ages. And so I would say, like, even that is going to have an impact if a mother or father is more likely to hold their daughter if she's crying where they walk over and like kind of pat their kid on the back and like brush it off for the little boy that that's going to start creating those narratives so early yeah well i i I wrote about this and when i was in grad school um is the the sexualization Mm -hmm. to i specified to women um, from infancy that's been happening for thousands of years. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's so profuse now in the 21st century to the point that like infant children's clothing is tight for little girls and loose for little boys. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, we're categorizing the, the low, you know, what's written on there, you know, the little girl's one says, you know, future nurse and the little boy says future doctor or something like that. Yeah. And I, 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 you know, get over the, the quotes and whatnots, but there's so much stigma around sex and how we present ourselves. Yeah. Physically, like in the kink community, they're, they're, they're frown, you know, it's, it's in many situations it's frowned upon by like the ticky tacky 1950s lifestyle household when in reality like i'm pretty sure that you know typical couple that seems so put together has got like a closet full of whips but they Mm -hmm. hide it and that's why it's acceptable it's because they don't show it to the world but we've got the different categories of people i don't know if categories is the right word clicks um you know we've got people who wear those bondage chains around their neck and then go out into public and it's it's part of who they are and their appearance um and yet that's those parts of our identities that we wish to express and yeah depending on what social scale versus the ones that there can be more secretiveness around. Yeah. And, and that showing the world that, you know, I'm wearing a harness, you know, is this just like telling the world I'm a pervert, which isn't necessarily the case, but that's how people are seeing you with Mm -hmm. the conditioning that's happening a lot of the time. Far more less nowadays, just because it's happening so much more often and people are calling it out, which is great. So I I don't see this. I see, well, I guess I see this pattern that I'm speaking about dying out slowly. Yeah. 
which is great. You know, that's a beautiful thing to be able to see is people being allowed to express themselves and however they want to. Um, and I would love to see, you know, in, cause I had, I had a very, I want to say profuse. I don't know if that's the right word. They were very in-depth. That's the word. I had a very in-depth education through the school system about Mm -hmm. sex since like sixth grade until like basically I graduated high school. Like there was always such a sex education. And I don't remember a single bit of it educating about the kink community or like toys yeah. How to responsibly use a dildo, how to, you know, not be aggressive or, or, you know, how to responsibly, I'll just use the word responsibly, tie somebody up for some sexual play. Yeah, and that, that definitely falls into, like, now you're branching out more into, yeah, niches of mm-hmm. kink and BDSM, right? Yeah. Which I I can understand where they're not necessarily touching on that through high school and stuff because there has been such a conservative model around sex. Mm -hmm. I do think there is a lot of things and like starting at younger ages, that would be really appropriate in teaching to kids and helping them understand not only their own bodies, but helping to decrease shame around that other people have different bodies than us right even if it's sexual anatomy um helping to destigmatize what their own anatomy is I mean it's through the coaching I've done there's so many women who literally have no idea what their pussy even looks like Mm -hmm. right they don't they don't know like even the difference of where their urine comes out versus where a penis goes in. Yeah. Yeah. There is say, I mean, right. that education stems over into men. It's a, a lot of people believing that women can't pee when they have a tampon in. Yeah. Yeah. Or that a tampon is going to cause you to lose your virginity, right? Yeah. Virginity yeah. can be defined in so many different ways as well. Because Mm -hmm. let's say somebody gets raped at a young age or female gets raped at a young age or male. I mean, either one, you could have penetrative sex. Mm -hmm. But in that instance, like, would you say that they lost their virginity? Like not, not all those people would. To them, they're not losing their virginity until it's that consensual space. Yeah. With a partner. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Like one of, one of my absolute favorite um, mind exploration and like reality breaking points was from the book, uh, The Ethical Slut, also phenomenal book, but very early on, they're like, okay, what is sex, right? Does that, does that mean like a penis is going into a vagina? Like, does that mean it's going into any other hole? Does there have to be penetration? Like, could it be that, like, you're mutually masturbating in a space Mm -hmm. with somebody, but you guys aren't touching? Like, could it be just because we're talking about sex that we're having sex, right? Like, but bringing this much broader opening to allowing individuals to define what that is for them, when that is for them. Mm -hmm versus it being it is this one thing and this one thing only yeah and then on top of that like especially like this is a stigma that happens to women is that purity that that virginity Mm -hmm. that is so desired by men like once it's gone it's almost as if she's not desired anymore yeah so that loss of virginity is viewed differently and felt differently for men and women. Like it, you know, Mm -hmm. women there, you know, it's hit or miss. You could lose your virginity. You could do it with someone you've been with for 
let's say you're in high school, you senior in high school, you've been with them since, you know, freshman year or whatever, four years. You're all totally responsible about it. And yet a woman could get shamed for it. And granted, it could be, you know, one night stand. It really doesn't matter. No one should be mm-hmm. shamed for having sex. <laughs> um, and then on top, then women are viewed differently. It's like we're used goods now. Yeah, well, and where men, like, the point they lose their virginity, let alone upping their their number of partners, yeah. Yeah. are ranked higher because they've had more sexual partners. Yes. Right? That's, it's very rare that males are slut-shamed and will mm-hmm. actually, they'll be boasted up and lifted up about it where female populations will be demeaned and berated. Mm-hmm. And the, because you know, there's this whole bullshit about the number count, mm-hmm. which I have mixed feelings on. The majority of it is that it's bullshit and people need to stop prying into my sex life. <laughs> like it's none of your goddamn business how many dicks have been in my vagina mm-hmm. or my butthole or my mouth or my ears or my nose like it really doesn't matter <laughs> like you don't need to know that and I do think that sex should be talked about more openly mm-hmm. but not in a way that promotes shaming in any yeah. form and that type of sexual communication it really only promotes shaming women. Yeah. And well, or there, there is shame towards men, but it's when I see that more when they are in that feminized or more submissive Mm -hmm. role. Like if a guy wants to get pegged, that this is something that now is shameful. Like I think the stigma for like being homosexual because you want anal play as a guy has probably decrease that may also just be the communities I'm associated with now Mm -hmm. but it's definitely something that like if a guy wanted anal play like and to receive that Mm -hmm. there's a lot through our society that like tells him there's something wrong with him that he would want to be in that receiving position right yeah yeah because uh it's 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 not every person and not every man has that desire. And that's fine. Yeah. Not everyone should. And and women are kind of like, you know, I, I don't know many women who haven't been like, yeah, I should, I, I don't really feel like sticking anything up there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, that's just, it's <laughs> the way a woman works is to be penetrated. It's like puzzle pieces. And men and women just, you know, penis and a vagina fit together like that. Um. And so I can understand, I don't agree, but I can understand why there is that stigma for men Mm -hmm. is because not every man has that thought. Yeah. And so I get it. I don't agree with the people who are shaming the men who do have those thoughts. And I can also understand why it's a little bit more difficult for women to really under, you know, empathize and like have understanding. It's like you can empathize and feel for somebody but you've never actually gone through what they've gone through Mm -hmm. and it's like uh parenthood we'll go with that i don't have any kids you do yeah you could tell me the trials and tribulations that you've gone through as a parent and i can be there and i could be like yeah no i totally agree that would suck but it it would suck for me like i don't know it in the detail and depth that you do Mm -hmm. so that's the same concept for what that shame feels like for men yeah that women, we can't really level with them on that because we haven't we've felt certain shames sure for women yeah um but it's not the same shame yeah there's also been I feel like at least in my experience like starting in high school where sex becomes more of a thing right there's a lot more acceptance for female populations who were exploring their sexuality and potentially bisexual mm-hmm. versus the male populations. Yeah. Right? Then there was also, oh, it just flashed and then it disappeared. So oh, no. never mind. <laughs> I hate it when that happens. But 
there's, yeah, there are a lot more of those stigmas around not being a man, quote unquote, right? Mm -hmm. Versus like that there, there is a little bit more of that openness around female sexuality, at least in that one space and then being able to play with other females. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd say there's probably a lot of other psychological narratives going into that as far as like the females not as likely to get them pregnant and all these other evolutionary social dynamics as well Mm -hmm. but yeah that's I mean most most guys are totally down for their partner going and playing with another female but if their female partner wants to go play with another male that's where Mm -hmm. things can start getting sticky and jealousy and insecurity flares yeah well even even uh going as far as the instead of it being singular Mm -hmm. if you're in a you know consensual monogamy or a partner with a male and female and the girl wants you know the guy's always like yeah bring another girl to the bedroom let's have a threesome Mm -hmm. but the idea of bringing another man it's 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 i i don't think i've ever been in a relationship where that would have ever been on the table yeah, that that can be a much larger push and struggle. Mm-hmm. Um, I I know some guys who've done that, and even like very on and early on in my sexual experience, um, one of the guys I dated, him and his friend would boast about how they had done this thing. Granted, they had not specifically like touched one another, right? They had maintained that that barrier of distance. Yes. So they weren't interacting. It was only any sort of intimate touch with the female partner. Correct, yeah. Um, and there's there's nothing wrong with that, but it's also acknowledging that like those those discrepancies show up because there is fears about homosexuality and male sexuality in general that way but also like another woman's not a threat, but a man is. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's uh, for the man. The the other woman's not a threat to his security in the relationship, Mm -hmm. but the man is, but it's (laughs) It's the opposite for the woman. woman. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Like you could be like, oh no, it's just like, She's going to just be a play, a play thing. I don't mm-hmm. know if I should say play thing. Sorry. Sorry, everyone. There's some people, there are some people who hold that view of, of their outside partners. I don't agree with it unless it is consensual and they're like, I want to be a play thing. Cool. Right. Yeah. Then yeah. more power to them. <laughs> but like in a relationship, bringing in a third party, it could be, you know, the, you know, uh, every every time it's been proposed to me it's uh oh no it, it would just be for like one time like it won't you know it's not mm-hmm. like we're gonna go and hang out with her all the time and I I've never followed through with that more of I didn't like the, the lack of uh reciprocalness in mm-hmm. I don't know if that's a word but it is now um in you know if I bring if we bring another party in, why can't it be a boy or a girl? Mm -hmm. And if you can only allow a woman in, then we can't allow anyone else into the bedroom. Yeah. There needs to be some sort of equality in the bedroom because of the lack of equity that already exists. Yeah. And I do want to clarify, it comes down to those agreements Mm -hmm. between the partners, because maybe like, maybe the woman only wants to have other female partners, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's being willing to have those conversations that can feel very uncomfortable. Yeah. So you can create those understandings about how to play and share and explore in those places together. Mm -hmm. And you have, and when you make those agreements, make those, like, don't like, don't ever say yes when you have intentions otherwise. Yeah. Like if part of you, like I'll speak for to men here, if part of you is saying yes, you 
want to have another party, boy or girl doesn't matter, into yeah. the bedroom. And you're telling your partner in this agreement that it won't lead to what she might fear. And then part of you is like, oh, no, I actually really want to have a threesome because I'm like, I like sex and I want to have it with all the ladies. That's that's not an agreement. Mm -hmm. That's a lie. Yeah. If, if you're manipulating a situation with your partner so that you can step out because you're thinking about stepping out, but you don't want to hurt them. So you're trying to do it in a way that won't hurt them. That's not mm -hmm. an agreement. That's not, yeah. that's not what's going on. That's not what you're communicating. If that's what you want, communicate that. I can't guarantee that's going to be the outcome that you want. But that's, that is, com communicate that. That's how, that's, that'll be a healthy sex life. <laughs> communicate that because then and the same goes for women mm -hmm. if you're bringing in a third party because you are desiring outside people and you're not communicating that to your partner that's not healthy either well i'd say there's also the the inverse if you're saying yes to this experience mm -hmm. just because you think it'll help you keep your partner Yes, totally. Yeah. There, there's some other repairs that need to go in there. I have had so many people approach me, especially since I've been openly poly and going through this whole world of coaching where they're like, I have so many people like talk to me and they're, they're couples wanting to now become poly because they think it'll fix their relationship. I will mm -hmm. tell you right now, there, there's probably... Oh, maybe 1% chance that'll fix your relationship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's if like having the, a baby bigger, with your marriage. Yeah. The, the bigger majority is it's going to make those issues more glaring. It's going to show you where there is weakness mm -hmm. in your relationship and the things to be worked on. So if you want to push into that edge and you and your partner are gung ho to work through those spaces together, right? then then dive in but otherwise try to find what's coming up first mm -hmm. and then and then expand and move yeah. outwards to bring in yes other people exactly exactly that is that is true communication without mm -hmm. lying to yourself which is a big one if you're not being honest to yourself you might unintentionally miscommunicate to your partner yeah so yeah, first no, be honest that's... with yourself and then, you know, take courage and be kind and communicate with your partner mm -hmm. what it is that's coming up. And if you're too scared to have that conversation with that person, you shouldn't be having sex with them. Yeah. And, and maybe that's the thing. Maybe you guys need to take a pause from sex. Mm -hmm. Maybe you need to explore your own self pleasure practices and masturbation mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. and dropping into what actually feels good in my body because there's there's many women who even into their 40s and beyond have never embodied that feeling of orgasm for themselves yeah. yeah and I can guarantee a part of that is because they're not they're not getting into those states of relaxation and letting Maybe. go so yeah. there there's probably layers of pain and numbness that mm -hmm. come up with that space of sex and they're and, just doing it because it makes their partner happy. And to me, that's a no in your body. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a easier to know when your body's telling, you no. I I'm going to say this purely as, as a woman that I'm saying easier. <laughs> it's just cause <laughs> I don't have, I don't, my vagina is still in there. Um, when you actually start to naturally lubricate yourself. I mean, it's a little bit different for men because they don't do that. Mm -hmm. So that's like a biological way of knowing whether or not your body is ready. Are you naturally lubricating? No. Figure out why. Well, and I do want to clarify just real quick. I do know you need to get going. Mm -hmm. um, just because a woman's body like her genitalia is aroused yeah. mm -hmm. doesn't mean that her emotional body 
or her mental body yeah. is aligned with that space. Yes. Um, once again, Agreed. referencing back to that book, Come As You Are, um, she she has a whole chapter in there actually outlining how men will take it as a cue that a woman's turned on and ready for sex because she's wet. Yes. Where like there's a there's a whole website where it's just pictures of like what like men will say was their cue that this woman was aroused and ready, right? Versus yeah. women holding up the sign of what their rapist told them. Yeah. And in that, that's like, yes, there's there's listening to the body. There's also listening to your emotions. Like, do you do you feel connected to this person and like you want to explore this space with them? There's also listening to your mind. Like, if those three things aren't aligned, your brakes are gonna be on. Yep. And there's going to be tension, contraction, resistance which can bring up numbness and pain yeah. in the body with that experience. So mm -hmm. exactly. do you have anything else you want to add? And then we can, we can get closed out. Uh, I guess the only thing I would say, you know, on what we, you know, tying together what we were both saying is communicate mm -hmm. with your partner and yourself and your body and your mind. Yeah. A lot of communication that has to happen for like, good I don't want to say good but like intergalactic sex <laughs> well and that's that's if you're noticing like that that base foundation is that communication in your own body and being able to listen to it being able to hear your yes and your no being able to understand what's coming up as resistance yeah. to being able to take whatever steps forward that you want if anyone who's listening wants help in those areas you can find links to contact Rachel Rose or myself. Mm -hmm. And even if you don't work with either of us, we can help you find whatever those resources are. Mm -hmm. So you can move forward and, and enjoy those spaces and create deeper connections and more pleasure in your lives. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you. As always, Rachel Rose, it was fantastic. And I very much so look forward to our conversation next week as well. Yes, be as well. Have a great afternoon, everybody and yourself, Alex. All right. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.